Denise O'Neill was a 28-year-old woman living in Palm Beach, Florida. She was an adventurer who loved traveling. She loved visiting museums as well as recreation such as swimming and scuba diving. Denise spent most of her childhood in New Jersey or San Diego, but at the age of four, her family relocated to Dublin, Ireland for two years before returning to the United States to begin first grade. The oldest of three sisters, Denise was the first in her family to attend college. She graduated from the University of San Diego with honors in 1989. Following the completion of her master's degree at Boston College, she relocated to Brookings, Oregon, where her family managed a restaurant by the riverside. During her time there, she discovered a passion for teaching and began to volunteer at a nearby high school. In 1992, she moved to Palm Beach, Florida to set out on her own. She applied for several teaching positions, however, she was rejected due to lack of experience. While she was trying to find a teaching job, Denise worked as a waitress at Charlie's Crab Restaurant in Palm Beach. By all accounts, she loved her life and was making good enough money at her job. Her co-workers said she was punctual and never missed her shifts in the two and a half years she'd worked there. On July 15, 1995, after Denise missed her shift for two days in a row, her manager called her home. When no one answered, they became worried that something may have happened to Denise, so the manager notified police. The police immediately launched a missing persons investigation. They visited her apartment and noticed that it was clean and organized, with no apparent signs of forced entry. However, Denise's car was missing from the parking lot. Police checked her answering machine and found an alert from her credit card company informing her of an unusual transaction on her card. Detectives questioned her neighbors, but no one had seen or heard anything suspicious. Police would later find Denise's car in a parking lot across the street from her apartment. Inside the car, police discovered two soda bottles alongside a cigarette butt on the driver's side of the car. Family and friends were vehement that Denise did not smoke. Police also found Denise's pink jacket on the back seat of the car. Detectives ordered a forensic investigation of the car. Crime scene techs noticed that there were traces of sand in the vehicle. Upon analysis, it was revealed that the sand was not typical of beach sand, but rather that of limestone. Crime scene technicians also found several fingerprints inside the car as well as outside. Police believed that the car had been driven by someone other than Denise. Investigators found that on July 13th, Denise's credit card had been used to purchase a pair of women's sneakers at around 2.30 p.m. However, Denise did not show up for her shift, which would later occur at 5.30 p.m. Police believed Denise would disappear in that three-hour window. Later that same day, someone withdrew $700 from Denise's checking account. However, the CCTV at the ATM machine was not working at the time, so police were unable to determine who actually took out the cash. The investigation would continue. Eventually, police received a call from a concerned citizen about a body found in a nearby canal. The deceased body was identified to be that of Denise O'Neill. Her body had been bound by a belt, shoelace, and a dog leash. She had then been wrapped in a large pink sheet, with the sheet tied around with two electrical cords, both with heat rocks attached to them. A heat rock is an artificial rock which utilizes electricity to generate heat. It is commonly used to warm up cold-blooded creatures, such as pet snakes or lizards. Police also found black dog hairs on this sheet. Police believed that whoever killed Denise owned a reptile and a dog. An autopsy revealed that Denise had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. The sand located inside of her car resembled sand found at the canal, where her body was later discovered, suggesting that her killer most likely used her car in order to transport her body. Police then looked into Denise's neighbors. One of the neighbors seemed to appear in front of media multiple times. When giving these media comments, he claimed, as he did with police, that he did not know Denise at all. His name was Luis Caballero, and he was the next-door neighbor of Denise. 
detectives would soon learn from Luis's neighbors that he owned two pets, a chow dog and a boa constrictor snake. Luis was questioned and denied any involvement in Denise's murder. He claimed he had never spoken to her other than saying the occasional hello. At the time, Luis was unemployed and was facing severe financial issues. He had unpaid phone bills of over $6,000 from calling phone sex lines, as well as unpaid rent. Police searched Luis's apartment and found several clues indicating that he was the killer. Once inside his home with a search warrant, police found a large terrarium containing a boa constrictor. Elsewhere in the home, they located his pet dog. The terrarium had impressions at the bottom which seemed consistent with the heat rocks. They also found a black shoe without its shoelaces. Denise had been tied up with a black shoelace. Crime scene technicians found bloodstains on the bedroom carpet and scissors with blue fibers in between the hinges. Denise at the time had been wearing a blue top. While the circumstantial evidence surrounding the boa constrictor and the dog were indicative enough of Luis's guilt, the most incriminating evidence detectives found was that of Denise's gym membership card. It had been stashed underneath a cardboard box. Luis stated that Denise had never entered his apartment, however, police believe that she had actually been abducted and taken there by force. Detectives surmised that during Denise's captivity, she realized her life was in danger and she left the gym membership card behind for investigators to find. Police then questioned Luis about whether he had ever been inside of Denise's car. He claimed he had never been in the vehicle, however, police found his fingerprints inside of the car. When police presented the incriminating evidence, Luis suddenly changed his story and claimed that actually his friend and roommate, 19-year-old Isaac Brown, was the killer and that he was an unwitting witness. So, Isaac approaches her and confronts her in the hallway? Uh, yes, he approached her and grabbed her from behind as she was going into the door. So now she's into your apartment. Yes, Isaac has her on the belly. Uh, I'm a little bit hysterical. I never thought it was going to happen. Isaac, however, claimed Luis was the real killer. He said Luis was desperate for money and had been wanting to rob and kill Denise for quite some time. Isaac's prints were also found inside of Denise's car. It was discovered that after the two men murdered Denise, they dumped her body at the canal. The two killers then went to a sit-down restaurant called the International House of Pancakes and shared a meal. Police went to the restaurant to question employees. They claimed that there were not actually two men there, but three customers. This meant that there was actually a third man who contributed to the death of Denise. Strangely enough, Isaac and Luis had never mentioned a third man. Investigators looked into Luis's past criminal record and found a man who had helped Luis previously steal a car. This accomplice was named Robert Messer. His fingerprints were later confirmed to also be on the inside of Denise's car. Robert was brought in for questioning, and he claimed that Luis and Isaac were the ones who murdered Denise, and that he had only helped them dispose of her body. A DNA test tied only Luis to Denise's sexual assault. Police believe that Luis had planned the attack, and when Denise was doing her laundry, he grabbed her and forced her into his apartment. They believe that Luis and Isaac then tied her up and forced her to tell them her ATM PIN number. They think that Luis took the ATM card and withdrew all the money he could, leaving Denise behind with Isaac in the apartment. While Luis was away, detectives surmised that Denise was able to secretly leave her gym membership card underneath the cardboard box. On the way back, Luis picked up Robert Messer, and when they returned, Luis sexually assaulted Denise and strangled her to death, not knowing that she had left behind a clue. Detectives remark on the callousness of the men who were able to throw the body of Denise into a canal and then saunter into an IHOP restaurant. Luis Caballero was charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and the murder of Denise O'Neill. He was sentenced to death. 
Robert Messer was convicted of manslaughter, and while he was sentenced to 15 years in prison, he served only five before being paroled. Isaac Brown was convicted of five criminal counts, including second-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Luis Caballero died in prison of cancer in 2013. Those closest to Denise comment that her bravery and ability to think quickly in a stressful situation may have prevented countless more atrocious acts from happening. 